All right. Our next panel today is going to be the Galvanizing Talent Panel. The panel will be moderated by Dr. Erica Wagner, who serves as Business Development Manager for Blue Origin. Prior to Blue Origin, Dr. Wagner was the Senior Director of Exploration Prize Development and Founding Executive Director of the XPRIZE Lab at MIT. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wagner and the rest of the Galvanizing Talent Panel. So thanks. Uh, let me take care of a couple of quick items of, of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, first of all, to all of you who came out for the Blue Origin reception last night, thank you very much for joining us. We collected a bunch of business cards. I promised I would draw some names for Blue Origin t-shirts. So uh, Vera Milani from Mars City Design, Paul Gemperlein from Lith Labs, and Yash Chandramuli from Georgia Tech. Find me afterwards. We'll get your sizes. We'll get you t taken care of. Uh, the other announcement I wanted to, to share, uh, if you have been around the New Space Conference for a couple of years, you've been hearing about the International Space University Executive Space course. Uh, that is a course that has been in uh, Strasbourg at the ISU Central Campus for uh, over a decade now. They came up to Seattle looking for, for some more of the New Space flavor last year for the first time. That course is going to be offered again November 6th through the 10th in Seattle, really geared towards mid-career professionals looking to break into the space industry, invest in the space industry, uh, or learn more about the industry from a business policy technology perspective. If you're interested in learning more, find uh, Ofer Lapid or find me. We can share with you more of the, what's going on uh, up in Seattle. With that, uh, glad to have our panelists here today. Uh, we are joined for a discussion about workforce development, uh, diversity, and the future of the industry. Uh, these are our topics that affect all of our companies, uh, large and small. Uh, what I'd like to do is have each of the panelists just quickly go in and introduce yourself uh, and where you're coming from, and then we'll jump into the meat of it. Okay. Um, I'll get started. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Dave Bowles. I'm the uh, director of NASA's uh, Langley Research Center. Uh, really happy to be here this afternoon. It's kind of, it, it's great for me. We're celebrating our centennial this year. So we're 100 years old, uh, July 17th, 1917. Broke ground on the first building there, not as part of NASA, but as part of NACA, National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. And it's, we, we've had a great year. It's fun looking back on all the great things we've done. And, and as you heard from a lot of the earlier panels today, it's the people that do all of those great things. And, and so it's fun looking back, but what I'm really passionate about and what I've been spending a lot of time thinking about is, okay, who are those people who are gonna shape the next 100 years? So, so I've got some thoughts on that, so I'm really happy to be here. First time I've been to New Space. I've really learned a lot uh, this first day and a half, so looking forward to it. Thanks, Dave. Melissa. My name is Melissa Farrell, and I'm the Vice President for Commercial Programs at a consultancy, Stellar Solutions. David stole my line. It really is the people. I agree. That's why we're here. That's why we're in this business. It's exciting. Galvanizing talent is about excitement in the workforce, and so looking forward to having a, a lively discussion about that. Um. <clears throat> Um, my name is Matthew Reyes, um, former NASA Ames Research Center. My first job there about seven years ago, maybe more, uh, was actually managing internship programs and helping with the recruiting of students to come in. Uh, my time there over the seven years was really focused as well as getting the workforce uh, up to date on uh, skills with advanced manufacturing and how we identified new talent that, brought, that came into the center to help improve uh, with design thinking and, and, and the development of small spacecraft. Um, today, I represent a, a group called Dent the, uh, Dent the Future. Uh, we created a, a conference last year called Dent Space at the Palace of Fine Arts. Erica was uh, one of our keynoters. And uh, we are looking to really kind of bring together a, a more diverse crowd uh, for deeper conversations between the actual engineers and people who are just starting to be interested to figure out what they want to do when they grow up. And so I look forward to uh, talking about some of the key things we can do to make that happen. Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay. I'm the head of recruitment at Spire Global. Um, for me, I've been there for two years now. When I first joined the company, there was about 28 employees. Um, it's now grew to 128, and I've just loved every minute being a part of that. Um, I think for me, it's great to just kind of share with you the experiences I've had along the way of recruiting at Spire. Um, and again, just really kind of chatting with the other panelists. We've got some amazing people here. Um, learn about what challenges they've come up against and how we can kind of collaborate together to come up with better solutions. Great, thanks Lindsay. 
So I wanted to just start with the, the sort of meta question here. We're, we're, our panel is called Galvanizing Talent. When you think about galvanizing talent in your organization, what are the things that, that frame that up for you? Dave, why don't you kick us off? Yeah, oh, okay. Um, so being a government uh, agency, we have some different uh, rules and res uh, restrictions, but actually I think they present uh, some unique opportunities. But um, first let me just start with some numbers. Uh, in, I'll talk about NASA Langley, but it's not too different than um, the rest of the agency. So I've got a workforce 50 and over of 61%, 30 and under about 6%, and I've got an attrition rate of about 5%. So it, there's not a lot of knobs to turn there. So, so when I think about how I shape that workforce for the next 100 years, we've done a few things at Langley, and actually the agency is doing that. So we, we're looking at, you know, very strategically how we hire, all right, because uh, I don't have a lot of turnover. So when I make a hire, I want to make sure it's the, the right hire. So two things, uh, it's not... Uh, just backfilling. I'm looking at, okay, what are the, what are those skills I'm going to need 20 years from now, 25 years from now, 15 years, whatever, whatever the number is. So purposefully, if, I have senior people, mostly senior people. So when they retire, I don't just automatically backfill that position. People have to come and make the real hard case why I shouldn't go out and hire an early career for a new skill area. So, that, so that's one thing uh, we're doing, and then, um, so where is that pipeline coming from? So we got a lot of programs that generate that pipeline. A lot of, uh, a lot of intern programs, so that's part of our pipeline. It was funny, I was just talking to somebody at the break who was a um, Laura student, we call it NIFS, now was in a summer intern program, spent a couple summers at NASA Langley. Uh, and, and so that's part of that pipeline is generating that. Uh, and then when we get talent in, how do we keep them? Uh, and how do we grow them? It, it, keeping them, as I said, my attrition's not all that high, so keeping them is usually not a problem, although that could change with the, the changing workforce going uh, forward. But we're looking at programs, not traditional mentoring programs, but programs where we get early careers, we, we kind of put them in a group together, give them a special project, team them up with some more senior leaders. Uh, they have to report out. They, pick a special topic, we give them some training, it's like a six month long program, and, and yeah. so we found that pretty useful. And we'll come back and talk about those yeah. special initiatives yeah. that are happening at okay. each of these companies. Melissa. Um, so when I think about galvanizing our workforce, I really took to heart the word galvanize. It's about excitement, and I think new space is at the heart of a very exciting revolution. We're getting beyond the boundaries of what we've traditionally done for 20 years. We're starting to think very creatively that inspires, that inspires people to come to our workforce, but also to stay with it. And that, I think, is the big key. It's a challenge I see for many of our customers. How do we keep our workforce excited? How do we keep them innovating and engaged? So to me, it's really about keeping that spirit of innovation alive. Matt? So when, when I think about galvanizing talent, particularly coming from a Silicon Valley, you know, environment where we have hackathons at Facebook that employ tens of thousands of people. Um, I, I see a lot of these techniques um, that keep people here er, in, in their existing companies that are not necessarily being applied in some of the traditional ways, uh, in traditional space companies. And new space companies, I think, need to take advantage of these uh, heads up that tech companies here that are not involved with hard hardware development or with any uh, spacecraft development of these specific kinds of uh, events and kinds of marketing, internal marketing plays that not only keep people interested inside their corporations, but actually make uh, elicit FOMO, you know, the feeling of, of uh, what is it, feeling of missing out. And, and generating uh, an interest for people to come and apply for the jobs that you may not necessarily be listing, but get them in there through that excitement that you're generating. I think for me, obviously, it's really important just to kind of stay consistent with having that global mindset. I think that very early on um, for Spire, you know, our CEO, Peter Platzer, is from Austria. Um, our two co-founders are, um, one's from Canada, the other one's Belgian. So I think that it's always been that kind of mindset very early on for us to, you know, get as global as we can as quickly as we can. 
Um, personally, for me, having you know kind of made a, a large contribution to Grow Inspire to 128, um, I'm very, very passionate, and I have a real sense of pride um, in terms of who we bring into the business. Um, so for me, again, it's very important to have a think about what initiatives we're putting in place to retain. Um, you know, it's very easy to make um, new space sound very sexy, but what are we actually doing once we join the company um, to keep them and to make them feel like they're making an impact and adding value? So we were talking earlier about the fact that not all of our recruits are aerospace engineers anymore, right? That, that when we look out increasingly, I, I know at, at Blue Origin and other companies, hiring electrical engineers and computer scientists is one of the biggest uphill battles to get people to think about their skills as applicable to our industry. You want to talk about what that looks like at Spire? Yeah, well, I think that um, something we really focus on is not just hiring people within the aerospace industry. So we have a whole manufacturing team as we actually build the satellites in Glasgow. Um, I don't think a single um, engineer, apart from Joel, who's one of our, our co-founders, has actually worked in a satellite before. Um, so it's more about hiring, yeah, like electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, um, you know, really kind of branching out that global talent market tapping into people who perhaps have worked on mobile devices and things like that as well. Um, there's such a big talent market and it's just about finding the right person that has the right um, you know, EQ, the right passion, um, and obviously that you know, it's something that they would really be looking to kind of work on. Um, but finding people who have a, a transferable skill set, um, and again, that can, you can leverage that to a global, a global capacity. Yes, we keep hearing those words passion and inspire, and I think that links the workforce across the aerospace industry in a very mission-driven way. You want to talk a little bit about how that comes to NASA, uh, and in particular as you're looking to hire younger, younger employees to, to forward fill, how you think about tapping into that ethos? Yeah, well, that's definitely one of the things we look for is, is passion. We do have a, a, a pretty strong brand. Uh, we, you can you hear you read different things about that, but from what I see, uh, the NASA brand is is still pretty strong. Uh, but we look for that passion. You talked about um, you know hiring beyond just aerospace engineers. Uh, share a little piece of data. We we've been looking a lot uh, in the agency across all of our technical capabilities. Turns out the skill set that we have the most of is software. Engineers, uh, and, and it kind of surprised everyone, but it was very consistent with what we heard uh, yesterday. That's kind of one of the the big things that's going on. I don't have an aerospace uh, engineering degree, um, so yeah, it, it's passion. Looking for those again, looking for it, and, and trying to understand what those skills you're going to need 15, 20 years from now, and, and getting somebody's passion about that, and also giving the opportunities to move around and, and try different things. That's one of my big lines when somebody tells me, uh, you know, they're looking for new jobs. I say, hey, try a little of everything. We got plenty of hard work to do. If you don't like that, I got another. I got another 20 hard jobs uh, that I need somebody to do. Absolutely. So I think one of the challenges that we've talked a lot about in this group uh, and you see across the industry is how to avoid all panels that are um, all old white men, no offenses intended. Um, but how do, we, how do we get out of an industry that's traditionally been known as male, pale, and stale? How do we work to increase diversity in a way that, that this brings more skills and more problem solving and more creativity to the table? Uh, and, and let's talk about that from a specific strategy standpoint. Uh, Melissa, you wanna take a, a first shot at something specifically that you do in thinking about diversity and recruiting, retention? Well, I think we're, we're looking for, as a consultancy, we're looking to really bring best practices to our customers. And those can come from many places. They don't necessarily come from your customer's own community. They may come from a different sector. We work across all the sectors of aerospace. They may come from a different industry. They may come from a different country. So we, we really look at where can we find the best solution to the problem. And I think increasingly, I, I see our customers doing that also. I think for a long time, we were somewhat stagnant as an industry and like, hired like. Mm -hmm. But I see that changing very rapidly. Matt, I know at the Dent Space Conference, y'all did a, a really fantastic job of, of representing uh, the industry in, in all of its forms on stage. You want to talk about how sure. that came together and why that was important to you? Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, it, 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 with Dent Space, I, I don't know, raise your hands if you actually heard about the event last year. That was a good number. Um, the, uh, uh, 
the, the stage, we, we, Ariel Waldman and I had set out to actually really explicitly make the diversity uh, presented 50-50 uh, or more across gender, across race, across uh, skill sets and talents. We had artists of, uh, on stage with uh, professors. We had engineers with scientists um, and, uh, and comedians too. <laughs> and uh, the whole point here was to really kind of showcase and celebrate the, the, the shining examples to, to really kind of develop what we were focused on are culturally relevant role models. People who go up on stage and go, oh, that could be me. And, and that's something that, uh, you know, I used to work at GoPro too. We, we, when we were producing videos, we were paying very careful attention at uh, telling the stories that inspired people. And so the challenge, I think, for any company, but, you know, obviously for New Space here, is that there are, there, there's an abundance of talent out there that doesn't even know what you're doing. And we, you know, Bruce was talking a little earlier, it's like we, we have, uh, it's, it's not an echo chamber, but you know, we have this thing where we're all excited, but not everybody on the outside of this group is, is as, as excited or as aware. And that's the key thing with what, we're, what I'm personally focused on, is really showcasing and celebrate these shining examples of, of people who can you know, inspire the next generation to, to step forward and explore space. Inspire? Yeah, um, I think a lot of it definitely should be focused on having more diversity, particularly in leadership. Um, I, I think that obviously out of Spire we have 20 leaders, 40% of which are women. Um, and again, just having more marketing strategies to actually show that so it's very visible on our website. Um, uh, we've also had like our EVP and myself have spoke at a same, a same event um, back in Scotland. Um, and it was just amazing to kind of um, see the kind of slight glow on, on females' faces who didn't even know, oh, hey, they build satellites in Scotland. Like, who knew? Um, so I, I think that that's definitely something that, you know, having, as you said, the, the leadership um, and just promoting that because I think if you're a candidate from a candidate perspective and if you're interviewing a company um, and you're interviewing with a panel who display diversity, um, then there's going to be someone there that you can relate to. Dave, you want to talk about the initiatives underway at NASA? Um, yeah, I have to, Nair, since yeah. you uh, called me out there. So, uh, but, so, so a couple of things. First of all, um, on, on the leadership side, what we've tried to do is, is take diversity out from a, um, hey, you have to do this, and, right. and, and make it um, just part of doing good business and, and how we do business. And, and so looking at it in a much more holistic approach. Turns out uh, we have pretty diverse pools, but when we looked into some of the data, uh, th that diverse pool didn't always lead to a diverse selection, whether an external hire or an internal promotion. So one of the things, uh, two things we've, we've done, uh, I've moved to having panels uh, do the hiring and, and promotions. Because again, you got to get away from this, your, this unconscious bias. So if you're just comfortable with somebody who kind of looks like you, talks like you, and, and diversity in all senses, race, gender, all, all across the board. So right. we've gone to more panels. We've, we've brought a lot of training in on um, just unconscious bias, making people aware. Uh, I, I am firmly convinced um, that the majority of our leadership workforce who's doing that hiring, they're, they're, they don't have ill intent. They, a lot of times, they just don't know. So we, we've had a big training program, and I, I think it's starting to pay off. On the pipeline, and we're trying to get out there and tell that message, and, and tell that message all the way down to kindergarten up. Get, get, get that pipeline, get that pool of diverse candidates um, growing. Uh, and we had such a unique opportunity uh, this year uh, with the movie Hidden Figures. So mm -hmm. who, who saw Hidden Figures? Everybody better raise their hand. All right. So if you haven't seen it, you need to go out and see it. An amazing story. Uh, took place at NASA Langley back in the uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, it just, it's been such a great tool to go out. We've, we've had people, both our elected officials, school teachers, rent out whole uh, movie theaters, bring yep. busloads of kids kids in. So uh, that's been a tremendous opportunity that we're trying to leverage. But again, getting out, getting that diverse pool, and then having your management team understand 
that it's just, it's just the right thing to do. There's so much data out there saying having a diverse workforce is the right thing to do. It, it's not a, it's not a um, got to do. It's, it's, right. it's just makes sense. It's the right sense. thing to do. It's no, right and, and it makes good do. business sense as well. When I, when I look at Blue Origin, we are about a third of our workforce has 20 years or more of experience. As we look down at our, our, our younger hires, approaching 50% of, of our interns and new grads are, are women and, and underrepresented minorities. So we are seeing this wave of change sweeping through the industry. One of the places we don't see change is global diversity, uh, and much of that is, is on the heels of, of the challenges with ITAR. Uh, Lindsay, you want to tackle that one from your perspective on how you build a global, a global aerospace company and how that works? Yeah, so um, we are not regulated by ITAR. Um, so I think the regulatory change happened in November 2014. The day that change was made, we um, filed for EAR, uh, for Export Administration Regulatory Change. Um, we then opened up our Singapore office, so right away we had um, a team of software engineers that were working on satellite um, technology. In December 2015, so a month later, um, we opened up our Glasgow office. Our two co-founders relocated to Glasgow, and then it was up and running in January 2015. Um, we then had our first official um, employee in April 2015, right in time for us to launch our satellites in September that year um, on the PSLV in India. So I think obviously for, for myself, um, it certainly helps talent when there's a, a global market, like 117 countries that we can choose from, give or take a few that we obviously aren't able to do so. Um, but yeah, that helps. And you were talking earlier about the, the opportunities that you have for building linkages uh, between employees in your US offices, your UK offices, Singapore, elsewhere. Do you want to talk about uh, maybe Spire Week or, or some of those yeah, other uh -huh. strategies? Yeah, so we have um, something called Spire Week. It means that you can, or Spire will obviously pay for you to go to another office. Um, so we have four offices, one in Boulder, Colorado, um, San Francisco, Scotland, Glasgow, um, I need to give that a shout out. I'm trying to get more people to come there. Um, and Singapore as well. So I'll be going to Singapore in October. Um, but it's just a, a really good way for our employees to connect with other people and um, just see how they communicate um, and really integrate together as a team. I think that we work very hard when we communicate internally. And um, we do a lot of video conferences and things like that as well, right. um, just so we can engage people's body language. Melissa, Stellar works a lot across uh, with government clients uh, and, and more traditional aerospace. You run the commercial programs. What do you see as the differences uh, in opportunities and threats for, for those two sectors uh, and, and what you're seeing in workforce development? Uh, in terms of workforce development, I think there is a perception not entirely valid or true that legacy space is boring, staid, slow. Um, and what we see as we work across all the sectors is actually there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of cross-pollination between the sectors. So I think overcoming that perception, you know, not being in the echo chamber, getting the word out to new talent, young talent, talent from other sectors in aerospace, making sure people understand that there is room for innovation in all parts of what we do, it is probably a big challenge that we're all facing. Um, I think the length of the programs definitely, when, you know, when you're 20 and you, you hear about a program that's going to take 20 years, you may think, oh my gosh. <laughs> but um, what's, what's implied in that is that there are a lot of good meaty challenges for people to tackle and to really make a significant contribution to something that's very substantial. Matt, when you were at GoPro, you spent a lot of time storytelling and engaging audiences, bringing in new, new ears and new eyes. Talk about how you thought about approaching those audiences. What is, what's inherent in those stories you wanted to tell that brought new, new audiences to you? Yeah, no, this is uh, uh, front of every editor and producer's mind at GoPro. Um, you know, my focus was uh, on, on trying to engage people who had GoPros to, to give us uh, their content so that we could uh, make it look better. We had some really good success stories from balloon flights, from um, up aerospace, gave us amazing rocket videos, actually the fifth most viewed video of GoPro um, of last year. And so uh, the, the idea really is to kind of hunt down and empower individuals uh, to tell stories um, that, that, you know, 
when you're in a leadership position, uh, it's easy to be like, well, I want this and that, but it's really more important to sort of listen and see what stories bubble up amongst a, a workforce. You know, with GoPro, it was obviously customers, but it, it, it's the same analogy. Uh, listening to the workforce, identifying success stories, successful storytellers, and then empowering them to, to tell your message. When I was at NASA, and, and I can imagine plenty of brands are this way, they, they, they want to control the message, you want to control the brand. You have a public affairs officer, you have press marketing people who, who want to stick online uh, or on message. It's important, I think, to empower uh, employees to be pa who are passionate to train them how to deal with media, to train them how to deal with social media, so that they're telling your story as, as part of their passion, it's not necessarily part of their salary. And, and I think that is what's gonna capture more people to come in and say, oh, I want to purchase a service from you, or more importantly, I want to work for you. Dave, we're moving in, oh, go ahead. Well, Pick ju up on just it. add one uh, kind of thing on that about telling your story. So what I, the, the message I try to give to all my employees is each one of y'all are, are our best storytellers. Just go out and just talk to your neighbor. Just in, in, in talk in a, in a way that uh, they can relate to, that your neighbor may be an aerospace engineer, may work for NASA, may not. Uh, but, but just tell your personal story. I've got 1,850 or so civil servants, but another 1,600 on-site uh, contractors. They are our best resource to go out there and, and share that story and make it personal. We, there was a panel yesterday about con, you know, communications. And so just personalizing that story and, and just everybody go out and tell your story. I, I, we, we do with the government, you know, we, there is a lot of bureaucracy and public affairs office and getting everything approved. But I, I tell people, if you just stick to your story, you're usually okay. You know, don't just personalize it. Don't, don't start talking NASA policy and things like that because then you can maybe get a little off track. Uh, sometimes so you, you gotta be careful, but if you just tell your passion and your personal story to your neighbor or somebody you meet in a grocery store, that's that's the most powerful thing we can do. Absolutely. So, so you're talking about Langley coming up on its centennial. Yeah. Uh, we've been we've been looking back at what it's meant to recruit for for a hundred years. What does it mean to recruit the works, workforce for the aerospace industry for the next 100 years? What are some of the things that you think are, are gonna be key as we, we move into this next era? Well, um, you have to have the right environment we, we, in, in the culture, and you, you've gotta get people who wanna come there. I, I talked earlier about giving new employees an opportunity to work on a lot of different things. That's, that's one thing um, we're doing. Um, one other thing, and I kind of had an epiphany here over the last um, day and a half, just listening to things, is, uh, you know, there's some similarities. If I look back, and I wasn't there 100 years ago, but I have been there 37 years, so I've been there over a third of that 100 years. Um, you know, if I look at the burgeoning aeronautics uh, market uh, in, in that industry, there's some parallels, I think, to what's going on with space right now, and I, I think government is in a unique position to help that. And, and so when I kind of look at workforce, I try to look at it the, the broader thing. I am more than happy when I have an employee who goes to a new space company, an old space company, a university, wherever. I, that's good, that's another person out there telling that story, contributing to what we all have passion about. So that's one thing. And then there's partnerships. I, again, I have constraints on how many people I can go out and hire, so we rely very heavily on partnerships, traditional partnerships. Uh, I, I think there's a panel coming up later this afternoon talking about SBIRs. We use those a lot. That's a way to reach out to people. So when I, th I think about kind of my workforce, it's, yeah, it's the workforce I got si inside the gate, but it's, it's leveraging all of these partners from traditional uh, bigger companies to smaller companies to to helping SBIRs, so it's it's all of that, and and then creating that environment that's going to attract the new new employees. One of the, one of the things we don't do good enough uh, advertising. You know, a lot of people like to telework now, and and so getting away from the old hey big brick and mortar buildings. I'm 
I'm, I've got a revitalization plan at the center where I'm tearing down two square feet for every one square foot I build. Uh, a lot newer buildings, a lot more collaboration space in a very uh, liberal teleworking policy. So putting in those things that I think are going to attract the next generation of employees are some of the things we're doing. When you think about the next century of, of aerospace recruiting, Melissa, where do you go in your head? Well, I, I like a lot of what David said. I would definitely agree with that. I think that um, the, the challenge is keeping folks engaged, giving them an opportunity to try new things, to really step up and to learn. And that continuous learning, when we get busy, we forget. We forget to do that. It's everything from mentoring, you know, in a formal sense, and classroom education. But I think what Spire is doing is great giving people a chance to work in different offices with different groups of people within their own company is terrific. I mean, that's some of the best kind of learning. Right. Matt, where are we going for the next 100 years? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the one scary thing, being a space cadet myself, is the fact that we are entering the age of AI and driverless cars and, and all of these really exciting, you know, virtual mixed reality, whatever you want to call it, these competing corporations, keep competing businesses uh, against the future of space flight. On one hand, we keep hearing about the few less jobs that are going to be, it's going to be automated, and, and then we see that there's more and more jobs that need to be filled. And so it's, a, it's going to be an interesting time for it. I think the key thing to focus on is, as we're developing workforces in the future, is to identify what's exciting for the generations. Identify the existing work workforce, keep them excited, keep them engaged, but then keeping an eye forward on the newest technologies that you're competing against and leverage that in a way that brings them in onto your company. Because it's gonna be, uh, the people who are excited about space are gonna be just excited about some of the other uh, technologies out there. I think when we kind of talk about diversity, it, a lot of people are too quick to kind of pigeonhole it into just gender and nationalities, I think we need to take into consideration introverts and extroverts as well. Um, so basically at Spire we have a kind of flat, a flat structure, we have um, coaches and captains, kind of like a football team. Um, and the good thing is that your coach is in charge of your, your career development um, and then your captain is like your technical leader. So it's a great opportunity for people who maybe are a bit introverted, don't want to have to deal with the people or the human element of it. Um, but people that are like super, super passionate um, about what it is they're working on um, and have like a, a high skill set from a technical ability. Um, so it's all about giving everyone their place. Um, we also implemented a, a SEAL team as well. Now that was an iteration, um, a story about that. We received an email and we're saying we have this SEAL team culture. We always talk about how collaboration is a really big thing at Spire. Um, but even at that, there was issues surrounding that. Um, there was females, you know, emailing back saying there's not enough girls on this team. Um, you know, we have an office in Asia, we should have more people there. Um, but again, I think it was great that there's obviously this open door policy that people feel like they can, they can raise their voice and they can actually talk about it. Mm -hmm. And as long as we welcome these new ideas, that's where people feel like they, they'll always be able to play, you know, a, a piece in the bigger picture. So my last question, and then we'll go to a, a little bit of Q&A from the audience. As you think about the talent coming in the, in the door to your organizations, uh, it, we're, we're moving into to new ways of working, new ways of, of collaborating. What is something that you would wish for them to bring into you? What is, what is something that you're, you're seeking that uh, is new, different, uh, that, that a job seeker could, could bring to the table? Dave. Um. Passion and, and thinking more at a systems level uh, and, and really thinking about uh, multidisciplinary probably doesn't capture it, but, but really thinking about systems solutions and, and all the pieces that go into it. And one thing I just thought about uh, when we we're having the last question, I think it feeds into this question. I think we need to work with the university systems more. You know, that's where a lot of the talent is coming from. But uh, I know I look back uh, in, in my bachelor's, master's, PhD degrees, what I got is a bachelor's degree, let's say. Hell, you probably, they probably learned that in high school now. So I, I and, and if we kept up and if we interacted with the university system, so are they teaching the kind of classes that we as a community think this, the skills that we need? Uh, or have, have they caught up 
with, with this changing uh, kind of needs uh, and capabilities that this industry needs. And are we having those kind of dialogues uh, with the university systems? Melissa, what's your wish for talent? I, I think it's twofold. One is the passion and the optimism that comes with being new to the industry, but the other is um, teaching the older legacy space players that there is a different way to think about things and look at things and perhaps a different way to solve the problem. We all get very comfortable in the way we're doing things and we need to shake it up. Matt? When I uh, advise someone else who's hiring, you know, I, I have them, you know, I, I, it, it really think about how to engage a workforce, how to bring in people that have other interests that they can express, that they can share with other employees, and that they can uh, uh, help transform how they're doing the job and how everybody else outside in these different communities uh, uh, are, understand how they're doing their job because it's those unique things that people bring in that are going to capture more interest from the workforce and potentially customers. Um, I think obviously for me, I, I absolutely love hiring people who want to step out of their comfort zone. Um, I, I think that you know, brilliant ideas can come from anywhere. If you have the data to back it up, then you know, it's a free forum, you should speak up and, and do that. Um, but certainly when you ask people to step out of their comfort zone, you're identifying engineers who are, you know, solving or they're working on problems that haven't been solved yet. Um, and it's amazing to try and kind of give that emphasis to someone that you can join Inspire, you can be a part of that. Um, uh, again, just kind of, you know, accelerating innovation within the company. Great. We have just a couple of minutes uh, for questions from the audience. Thoughts, thoughts that folks would like to share. <laughs> Got a microphone coming around. From TouchSpace. Um, we, we talk a lot about workforce development in terms of late pedagogical eras. Um, so you're talking early careers, early, early engineering careers, um, late university. But there's significant research that says that the pre-K through three rate age range is absolutely critical. Um, so when we talk about building for 100 years, what are your specific plans for developing and connecting to that age range? Because in 20 years, those are gonna be your engineers. Dave, you wanna tackle that one? Uh, yeah, so we, we think about that a lot. I couldn't agree with you more. That, I, I, I go out and talk to schools uh, a lot, and I, I tell them, you know, talking to first graders, second graders, hey, y'all are the ones that are going to be doing this 20, 30 years from now, not me. Uh, and, and so connecting with those, so telling those stories, just making it exciting to them and getting out there and talking to them. I mean, just that, that can be amazing. We, we do a couple things that... Um, you know, rock, so we got this program called Rocket to Race Cars. All right, so uh, I'm in Virginia, big NASCAR uh, state. Uh, and it's, so we've hooked up with NASCAR. We go to the races, we have exhibits there. You, it's amazing how many young kids you can touch at an event like that. And, and just, um, just taking the time to do it. So I, I agree with you 100%. That's where it really starts. They are going to be. So you talk about the next 100 years, yeah, it's not us sitting in this room. It's people who aren't even born yet or people in kindergarten. That, that's where it's all out. So we've got to get out there and interact with them. And I'd echo what David said. We're, we're a relatively small enterprise, but we have a lot of staff whose passion is engaging in the schools, in the STEM programs, and sharing their excitement about space with kids, lighting that fire so that we we stimulate the next generation to come into this industry. I think one of the things that we've seen when we talk about diversity in the industry as well is that the, the, the cliff, we, we, we look at uh, kids in fourth grade and the genders are performing approximately equally and have, have similar levels of career interest in STEM. We look at them again in 10th grade and we've bifurcated. So there's something about those teenage years that, that seems to be particularly uh, sensitive. Matt, do you want to talk about uh, the programs that when, at AIMS that you were working on or other things that you've got on your agenda with that? Well, yeah, th so th there's a couple approaches. From a programmatic standpoint, yeah, there were certainly were uh, programs at AIMS that brought uh, children in, bust them in from, from schools. 
Um, from a, a dense space perspective, though, I think one of the things that I learned when I was talking to a lot of the folks in the audience is that they brought their children. Uh, so addressing that age group is really, um, I totally agree, uh, but it's going to be more the parents that are going to have the aspirations for their children, and being a rocket scientist is still a cool thing. Uh, it's like maybe a lawyer, maybe a doctor, but it's still there, and, and the bigger dreams come from that. So, so my uh, approach to this would be to kind of focus on parents who are going to be uh, wanting their kids to see and have those examples. And when you provide the culturally relevant role model, it becomes really easy. And, and that is the thing that inspired me years ago at Ames, in fact, was identifying culturally relevant role models and not have me be upstage, but have a, an adequate representative be the inspiration and in facilitating them to, to get the message out. Any other questions? Yeah, we got one back there. Okay. <laughs> yes, now All we can right. hear you. <laughs> it works. Dave Huntsman, NASA Glenn. I have a two-part question. I'll just throw it out and I'll sit down and let you answer it. Uh, to David and Erica, David, you mentioned that uh, with whatever limited new hiring authority you get, you feel compelled to focus it on the lower level, new, you know, new hires, et cetera, which most of the NASA centers have to do. But there is a problem we have in the agency across all the centers, and that is we went so many years, like over a decade, with almost no hiring authority, that we have this great middle of, you know, it's almost vacant of late 30s, 40s people. So we got people in their early 20s, we got lots of people in their 50s and even 60s, and the great middle, which is meant to mentor the people under them and train them, uh, it is really vacant. So if you could address that in a minute, I'd, I'd appreciate it. And then Erica, I wanted, uh, you know, we have an experience in NASA. You mentioned the 50-50 female male hiring kind of uh, uh, at blue. Um, in the last two years at NASA and looking at those sorts of uh, situations, we found out that we've done a pretty good job in new hires in terms of the ratio, but that when you look over a period of 20 to 30 years, there's a, a big branching that almost all our senior technical people, our 20 top experts in the, in the 20 technical fields are almost all male. And most of the females uh, uh, went into management and senior executive positions and everything else. Uh, at Glenn Research Center, we're probably a good example of that the top one, two, three, four managers are all female, for example. Uh, and I'm wondering if that sort of subject has come up uh, with you. I know you're a young company, but you've been around now for 17 years. So uh, I might want to address that. Thank you. Yeah, Dave, you want to talk about uh, the boluses of, of hiring that go through NASA? Uh, yeah, so your, your data's kind of right. I've got a lot of people at the upper end, uh, a small number kind of at the lower end, and, and a lot in the, in the middle. And, and so we. We do have an emphasis on, okay, ha first of all, for that group that's like five years away or any, any day away from walking out the door, how are we transferring that knowledge? So we're trying to, we're, we're looking for opportunities where we can team people up and, and bring that group up. I, I know as a senior manager, it's easy to fall in a trap when you're putting a team together, you're, you're looking, uh, you just go, to, to the people uh, to kind of quote your, your A team and because and you know, hey, this is really important. I got to get it done. It's got to be right. Got to have it on time. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm telling my leaders, hey, we got to resist that. We've got to reach out to that group in the middle. We got to bring them along. And, and you know, we got to, there's some risk with that sometimes, but if we don't bring them along, we're going to be broke because I've, I've got, you know, 50% of the people walking out of the door, I got this uh, young group at the bottom, and, and I've got all this skill in the middle. So we're trying it. It's, it's hard, but we, we've put a big effort on it. So you're, you're exactly right. And to your, to your second question, as I said, at Blue, we're seeing a, a great ability to, to bring in really diverse hires uh, in, our, in our new grad program, in our internship programs. Uh, as we get 
uh, as we look across the organization, we're trying to make sure that we're paying attention to not just recruiting and hiring, uh, but also retention and promotion, and that those are things that we know we can do better at, uh, and we're, we're working on it actively. With that, we are at our, our 3.30 mark. I will go ahead and take us off the stage to keep things on time, but thank you very much for your time and attention.